And she said, there's been a complaint and, uh, you know, we have to ask you to get off of this flight. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Bad Times Good Stories Podcast, the show where each week I talk with a guest about an awkward, embarrassing, or straight up bad time from their life that they're able to laugh about now or have learned from. My name is Joe Flanders, and I'm really excited because this week I'm talking to Lila Hart. She's a comedian. She's very funny. As I found out, she's a solid rapper. Uh... And she is talking to me about getting what she calls a DU fly instead of a DUI. She got arrested on a flight that hadn't taken off yet for drinking too much and uh, causing a scene. So she talks about that and the ramifications that uh, came from that. Um, but then we also talk about, you know, what caused that in a way. And um, Lila grew up and has spina bifida. Spina bifida is a disease that uh, affects the spine while you are in the womb, while she was in the womb, uh, and has resulted in her, she's, uh, she's four foot six, and um, so she talks about growing up with that and, um, you know, the effect that that had on her just in her social life and uh, personal life and life in general. Um, as you can imagine, there were certainly a lot of challenges there. Uh, which led to her um, in college and then after college drinking heavily to deal with uh, all of that. The good news is that she certainly has dealt with it now. Uh, she seems to be living her best life, and I really enjoyed talking with her. Um, yeah, it was just uh, a lot of laughs, but also, you know, learning something new about something that most of us don't have to deal with. But she's really embraced it. You know, she's found a whole community of other uh, of other people who have similar challenges and they've all sort of embraced them. And, uh, I just am really happy to hear that she's, she's doing so well these days. So anyway, I hope you enjoy the episode. If you do, please give that five star rating on Apple podcasts. We've had a few lately and it, it really just brightens my day. So I really appreciate that. Shout out to senior cat five for leaving the, uh, the nice comment the other day, just brightened my day. Uh, really, it's just nice to know that you, you guys like what I'm doing. And again, it just helps uh, put us above the rest of the hundreds of thousands of podcasts in the world. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, certainly appreciate that. You can always check out badtimesgoodstoriespod.com for past episodes, merch, and a link to the Patreon page. Supporting me in that way would also be fantastic. Uh, or you can email me at badtimesgoodstoriespodcast at gmail.com. That's all I've got for now, so without further ado, here's my conversation with Lila Hart. So how are you doing? How's your day been? Fantastic. Yeah. It's been really good. Tell me about it. You know, um, I'm wearing my Louisiana shirt, so... Right on. I'm excited about that. My dad's from Louisiana. I was going to ask what your connection is. Yeah, my okay. dad's from Louisiana, and my mom is from the Philippines. Wow, okay. So... Nice. Very interesting. How did they meet? Uh, they actually met when my dad was deployed in the Philippines. Okay. And, yeah, and then, you know, they got married, and here I am, American-born, in How did Hawaii. they... In Hawaii, okay. Mm -hmm. This is cool. We got Philippines, Louisiana, Hawaii, we got it all. Yeah. So was your dad still enlisted in Hawaii? Is that how you guys ended up in Hawaii? Yeah. So he, uh, I think, got stationed in Hawaii. Oh, that would have been the right so then word. that's how yeah. we uh, moved over there. So I spent like the first six years of my life in Hawaii. And then we moved to Marysville, Washington. And that's where I grew up. Okay. So, um, and then I went to Washington State University. Huskies? No. No. That, those were our that's, rivals. Damn it. Okay. I know. Washington. Uh, uh, I am a cougar. Cougar. There it is. Go okay. Cougs. <laughs> that's right. I'm sorry. That was blasphemous. Hus <laughs> Huskies. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wazoo Cougar. So how does that work? Like they met when he was stationed in the Philippines so d was that just like on time off from the base to go into town yeah. and then? Yeah. So I think my parents, they really have a cool love story. You know, yeah. they were like, they wrote each other love letters for three years. Really? Yeah. So they have like 
yeah, they were like, uh, I guess you would call it pen pals, but yeah. you know, they wrote each other love letters cause it was a process to get my mom to come to America. I bet. And also my mom had my two sisters. So my dad, um, you know, he has three girls. Well, I'm, I'm the one between my mom and my dad, but mm -hmm. my three sisters, like he, that's, those are his daughters too. Oh, so wow. He loved my mom and he loved my sisters and, <laughs> you know, brought them to America. That's super cool. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's funny. The, uh, my sisters came to LA to visit me and we, I have four nephews. Okay. And my sister was, you know, we went, we're taking the nephews to Disneyland. And my sister was like, oh my gosh, mom and dad never took us to Disneyland. And I was like, <laughs> bitch, they brought you to America. <laughs> I think that's better than Disneyland. You've you know? lived in Disneyland your life now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> America. Yeah. yeah. But I love my sisters and I love my nephews. Yeah. So. That's great. Yeah. I went, I had a doctor's appointment today uh, at UCLA, thankfully, because I've been, I had 90% of my large intestine removed when I was 13 oh, wow. uh, for colon cancer. Oh my gosh. It was a preventative thing. I didn't actually have it yet, but I would have gotten it. So thanks to like insurance changes, I was basically going to like a clinic for the last year. Mm -hmm. And finally the doctor was just like, Oh, you have like a, a real issue. Like you should be seeing a specialist. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, somehow it worked out with the insurance. So I got to go to UCLA and it's funny. Cause I, I've caught myself because it was like a great appointment. I felt really good, mm -hmm. scheduled a, a procedure in December and I was like riding high. And then like I got to the checkout window for the parking garage and it was $13. And I just instantly was like, <laughs> the world is a shit hole. Oh I was so gosh. angry. I, I initially took it out on the, on the worker. Uh, that's something I really got, I'm working on. Yeah. So I'm like, she's getting paid minimum wage or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is not her policy, <laughs> you know, but it's just so funny how it's just like, you know, the smallest things can just like, oh, everything's terrible. Right. I don't know. It's just something I'm working on. <laughs> but uh, just focus on living in the moment and being grateful for the little things. Exactly. Like your coffee mug. Exactly. Like my coffee mug. <laughs> um, so I, uh, I have a business trip coming up next month, which means I'll be flying, which means that I'm thinking every day about how I'm going to fly and then uh, die in the yeah. air. I'm not a good flyer. And it sounds like you had uh, quite an experience. I don't, did you make it to take off? You know, <laughs> uh, I was 24 years old okay. at the time and I was living in San Diego. So I was, I was getting on a Southwest flight mm -hmm. to go to Seattle to see my parents for their 25th wedding anniversary. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah. And I had a layover that was going to be in Oakland. So I'd have to switch planes right. and, um, on my flight there, you know, there was that like country song that was like getting drunk on a plane, <laughs> yes. you know, I think it's like by Luke Bryan. Sounds about right. And yeah. uh, I really love that song. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I remember getting to the airport and being like, I'm going to get fucked up on this plane. Like I knew that in my mind. I'm like, I'm going to have drinks. I'm going to have a good time. It's whatever. Yeah. Right. So, um, I also like, I, uh, I mean, I, I liked, I liked to drink a lot, you know, back mm -hmm. then. Yeah. And, um, so my first flight is from San Diego to Oakland. Mm -hmm. You know, I go through TSA. Of course, there's a little like bar right before you get on the plane. So I had, I think like two glasses of wine or something nice. beforehand. Red or white? Um, red wine. Cause mm -hmm. you know, good for my heart. Right. It's the healthy choice. <laughs> yeah. And I also, I mean, I, I liked to take an Adderall before too, cause I would be able to like drink more. Yeah. Right. There you go. Right. So Focus I had, I had popped an Adderall before I was like, I'm going to drink. It's going to be okay. And I, um, I get on the flights and I have some Jack and Coke. Cause that was my thing on the flight, mm -hmm. getting drunk on the plane. It's a good time. <laughs> Uh, I take a picture with the pilot oh, when we terrific. like land, you know, I have like the stewardess, like take pictures of me in the cockpit. <laughs> oh, once like, you landed, not yeah, during the flight. Yeah, okay. Once yeah. we I landed. Say, that might be a risk. Yeah, that, that would have been risky, right? <laughs> and then we land and uh, there's another bar. I go to that bar. I have more drinks at that bar. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm really feeling myself. I'm like, I am the baddest drunk bitch right now. Okay. <laughs> also, let me just like explain. I was wearing um, a red leotard and a black skirt and these like little booties. I looked so good. <laughs> and my hair was all curled. I looked amazing. And I get um, right before I was going to get on the plane to, you know, the check in person. Yeah. When I used to get really drunk, I was, so also became like um, a rap star. Oh, too. So great. I did a 16 bar rap. 
to uh, the stewardess, not the stewardess lady, like the check-in lady. So she was like, oh my God, this girl is so fun, you know? She enjoyed it? Oh, she enjoyed oh, okay, it. Good. It was like nice. the, you know, my name is Lila kind of rap thing. You want to break it down? Yeah, well, should I do it? I think so. Okay, so this is the <laughs> rap I used to do when I was really drunk. Um, I think everybody should have their own like rap. It's so silly and embarrassing now. I don't do this anymore, but I'll do it for you. Thank you. Okay, here it goes. <laughs> my name is Lila. You might call me a liar. Ooh, you just mad because I'm hotter than a fire. I don't like to argue, but yes, I love to party. Ain't nothing better than a bottle of Bacardi. Hitting up the clubs, maybe the rave, but it ain't my fault if I misbehave because we kissing, touching, grinding on the dancer. Boy, you say my name. Ooh, Lila, please. But don't be mad when I leave you like a tease because I ain't like them other girls. Bitches be too easy. But what you think I am? Some sleazy kind of busy. These rhymes, they be pouring straight out of my mouth because I'm the baddest, the best, without a doubt. So take a look at me and listen to my words or I might seduce you with these sexy little curves. Still some may call me a bitch, but the truth is I just tell it like it is cold-blooded killer out to get it making that money oh, super fast I'll yeah. be rolling up my dough. You know, I love my yeah. cash. So honey, I don't need you cuz I got my own take a look around I'm the queen of this throne. Oh shit yeah. That so, was amazing Imagine if I was drunk doing that. It was like so much more flavorful and amazing. Oh, I'm sure. And I was yeah. like, you know, in my red <laughs> leotard looking fine as hell, 24. And Anyways, you were in line to get on the plane? Yeah, doing this. <laughs> I'm sure of, everyone behind you is just In like, Oakland. Oh, oh no, not, not in. Oh, yeah, in, in Oakland. Because yeah, we had yeah. landed in Oakland. In front of everybody. <laughs> you know, I did that rap in front of everybody. Unprompted. Unprompted. <laughs> The lady who was checking on my ticket, she thought I was really cool. At yeah. least I think in my mind. <laughs> and, you know, I get on the plane and I go, I can't believe I just did that. It was amazing. Yeah, that, well, um, that really was. I, it just kept going and it was phenomenal. I, I thought it was going to be like a couple months. bars. I'm yeah, like, you, you know, my 16 bar rap that I have. And uh, I go sit in the front seat because that's what I like to do. Sit in the yep. front because you're closest to the stewardess because then you can ask for drinks and, you know, there you right go. there. Think it ahead. So I sit there and I'm sitting down and I make friends with the person that's sitting next to me. And all of a sudden we're about to take off. Yeah. You know, this is flight is going from Oakland to Seattle and um, three police officers come on the plane. <laughs> okay. And they look at me and they're like, ma'am, um, you're we, there's been a complaint. <laughs> Point. Somebody didn't enjoy your rap. Somebody didn't enjoy my fucking 16 bar rap, okay? They didn't like it. Um, and she said, there's been a complaint and, uh, you know, we have to ask you to get off of this flight. Oh. And I was like, no. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm not flying this plane. Like, I don't understand why I can't be drunk on the plane. It makes no sense. So I'll never forget. The lady goes like, if you don't comply, we could arrest you. And I was like, bitch, please. You know what I mean? <laughs> And um, everybody around me sitting next to me was like, no, don't take her. Like, she's fine. I was like, I'll be good. You know, but they were like, no, we're taking her. And I remember she was like swinging around my bag and I was like so angry. And then they handcuffed me. They literally handcuffed me oh, in shit. Oakland going through, you know, the airport. And I was like, whoa, this is really happening. You know, so I think I was like kind of part like in shock. And I was like, wait, am I like really going to jail right now? Did that sober you up a little yeah. bit? No. No. I'm still drunk. <laughs> Too drunk. Yeah. Um, and then I remember they put me in the back of a cop car. I'm in the back of the cop car. And it was like these two like male police officers. And they were kind of like, you know, laughing about it and like making me feel uncomfortable. I remember the guy was like, oh, you're because you're with the big boys now. And I was like, listen, sir, um, there better be some cameras in here because you shouldn't be able to talking to me like that. And then they kind of realized like, oh, OK, yeah. you know. Well, well, this gets better in the, in the story. But um, so then they had my handcuffs behind my back, like in the back of the cop car. And I remember it was really uncomfortable. So like I shimmied my way and like put my handcuffs like in the front. They did not like that. Oh, yeah. man. So that was like really bad. <laughs> and then I made the like, I told the police officer, I was like, I really have to pee. And he was like, well, you can't go. And I'm like, uh, I have spina bifida. Like I need to go like right now. And then he was like, my nephew has spina bifida and he's in a wheelchair and you're not. So you don't have spina bifida. And I was like, oh my God, oh, it's like boy. really horrible. Um, so eventually we get to the police station and, you know, they take my beautiful mug shot <laughs> and I'm like oh shit this is really going down I'm still like wasted at this point um and they uh they put me in solitary you know because you have to go by yourself at first or whatever really and, yeah they I, put, th I thought you'd just be in like a drunk tank with other no. people they're treating this like you had a bomb oh yeah no it gets you. worse 
Okay. okay. This is okay. So they put me in solitary. I remember there was like a one eight hundred number for like battered woman. So I call that number <laughs> first, and I'm like, "Help me!" You know, and they're like, "We can't do anything for you." Um, I call my parents. They're like, we're at the airport (laughs) waiting for you. And I'm like, well, I'm in jail. (laughs) And also my dad is a correctional officer too, by the way. So like, this was really horrible. And then finally they're like, uh, they decided to put me out of solitary Mm. and into, um, you know, the, Gen pop. Yeah. General population. <laughs> but I remember as I was leaving, cause there was like males on the other side and like this guy, like underneath the thing yelled at me. He's like, it's going to be okay. Beautiful. And I'm like, Oh my God, please don't try to flirt with me right now in jail. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Cause I know I look really cute right now. And my red leotard and you know, my hair looked good. Minus the crying. Um, so I get into general population and there's like maybe like 30 girls in there mm. and one toilet. So, if you have to go to the bathroom, like you go in front of everybody, yeah, everybody. Yeah. And a majority of the women that were in there were prostitutes. And I remember I'm like, so I'm standing there with my like red, low cut red leotard, also no bra and it's cold and my like little <laughs> skirt. And they're like, what are you in here for? And I'm like, um, I got arrested on a plane. <laughs> like it was embarrassing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I shouldn't be in here. So I sit down, um, I sit down and I sit next to this girl and uh, she's really nice. She got arrested for like fake money or something like, and she was like, oh my gosh, girl, I really wanted those two for one cami deals. If I didn't go to Forever 21, you know, my fake money wouldn't have gotten caught or whatever. She became my friend. We're still friends on Facebook. I love her. That's awesome. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So, and then I remember I'm sitting in there. And, you know, I had accepted my fate at this time. Like, I'm going to be in here for a while. This girl comes in and she's there for, like, stabbing her boyfriend. I'm like, come sit next to me. And, like, I just started leading this, like, discussion where, like, everybody went around and, like, said their name, like, what they were in there for. And, you know, it was, like, kind of like a group therapy thing. And I was asking the prostitutes so many questions about, you know, just prostituting. I'm like, well, this is you know my time to sure. ask questions. Yeah. To, I was like, I'm going to do something with my time here and like interview these people. Right. Yeah. You Try know? and find a positive in this shitty situation. It was so cold. I like took toilet paper and cause it's a cement ground mm. and I made like this nest that you would like a hamster would be in, yeah. you know, I made like a human hamster nest yeah. and that's what I slept in. Um, at one point, the cell that we were in, the phone was broken. Definitely. And I realized, I was like, this is like totally illegal. You can't have us in like a broken cell or like a broken uh, phone cell or mm-hmm. something. And uh, they kept me in there for like 17 hours. You know, it was <sighs> like a long time. And uh, I think they didn't like that. I was like talking back and like, I learned. That probably didn't help though. No. I would learn a <laughs> lot in, in the, it just made me, it, it Having had that experience being in jail just has really changed the way that I think about like our legal system Mm -hmm. and stuff, you know, and like they treated me so poorly and I'm four and a half feet tall, 75 pounds. Like they treated me like I had committed this horrible crime, you know, and I really I was just drunk on this plane. So, um, eventually I get out and I have to take a flight, you know, back to Seattle to, Mm -hmm. (laughs) <laughs> face my parents and I'll never forget it was I took another Southwest flight uh-huh. okay uh-huh. and as I'm going to check in it's that same lady at the ticket counter oh, no. and she's like what happened and I was like I spent the night in jail okay <laughs> but here I am take me to Seattle there will be no rapping today no rapping today <laughs> And, you know, it was just, it was devastating because my parents were, like, my mom was so worried. Um, I was so humiliated. I had laying there on the, like, I mean, I literally hit rock bottom on the cement floor. I'm like, you know, maybe I shouldn't drink so much. I might have a problem, you know? Like, that was when I was really starting to question my drinking problem. And, uh, but it was almost like being having such a horrible thing happen made me realize like I have people who love me like my parents and those are the people that really like give a fuck about me you know Mm -hmm. so my mom was like okay don't like someday you're gonna laugh about this someday it'll be funny she's like uh but we decided like not to tell anybody about it I didn't like post about it on Facebook I kept this like really like a secret thing that had happened to me and 
Um, I ended up moving back home for a little bit because I thought that I was going to have to, like, I had a court date and they were going to, you know, have a bunch of fines. And so I moved back to Washington. I called, like, the Oakland County, you know, department about, you know, figure out when my court day was. I called every day for two weeks. And I remember at the end of the two weeks I called and this lady answers the phone and she's like, you know, trying to figure out my case. And she's like, wait, are you... And I quote, the little one who got arrested at the airport. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And she goes, oh, we dismissed the case. It's been dropped completely. Oh. So they dropped all the charges and they dismissed everything. And I think because if you look back on it, like, I mean, that was a really dangerous situation to like, you know, I was I I was seriously arrested, put in the back of a cop car in general population. And what if something had happened to me? You know, right. and I think maybe they were like, uh, let's just let this go. You said the person you were sitting next to was a murderer? Well, she had stabbed her boyfriend. Oh, just uh, just a light stabbing. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah and there, so, I mean, there was also this um, this lady who was on drugs who like popped up and it was so scary. She popped up, looked me down in the eyes and was like, you don't belong here. And I was like, you're right. I don't. Yes. I don't want to be here. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So... Um, while you're in jail and it feels like, do you think part of the reason that you kind of like had this whole conversation going was that you didn't have to think about the fact that you were at rock bottom and questioning your life choices and everything else? Or was it just a genuine interest in these people's lives? I've always been interested in people's sure. lives, yeah. you know? And like, I, uh, I was like, I'm going to make use of this time. Sure. So, yeah, it makes sense. and it really, it just really showed me like a lot of people who are in jail, like don't, shouldn't be there. Yes. Shouldn't be there. And like the way that they treat you is so inhumane. It's so like scary. And it just, it just totally gave me the creeps, man. And you know, what's really crazy to me is, I mean, I've, I've flown a lot since then. Yeah. I've seen so many people who are, were even drunk, who've been even drunker than me on planes before. And it's like, and every time I see like a drunk person, it just like gives me like flashbacks to, yeah. you know. Well, that's the funny thing. It's like, I mean, it's, and I feel like it's so unheard of too like I, I googled it yeah and the only people that have really been arrested for being drunk on the planes were like you know celebrities so right. i was like oh, i'm famous <laughs> yeah and try to make myself feel better and i wasn't even a comedian yeah. yet at this point no so. you're just a, a rapping hot mama <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know it's so funny um so you know you said you were embarrassed and ashamed or whatever now not specifically this but was your lifestyle one where, like, this didn't shock your parents? Or did it come as a pretty big surprise? Oh, this was, like, the, like, this was the shocker okay. of the century. But did they know parents. you were kind of, so, like, So, you know, I was, uh... I was starting to like drink a lot during that time period of my life. Like, I went to Washington State University, okay? So it was a really big party school, okay. and... I didn't even really start drinking till I was 21. I mean, mm. I was a goody two shoes in high school and yeah. ASB president and all that stuff. And then I got to college and I'm like, woohoo, party yeah. time, yeah. you know, and it was, everything was uh, fine. You know, my first four years of college, everybody's around you is drinking so much. Right. But then I think once I graduated and moved to California and like, you know, I'm just starting to drink bottles of wine by myself and it's becoming this. You know, when you're getting so drunk, you're, you get to the point of getting arrested. And it's not even a DUI. This is a DU fly. That's what I like to say. Um, <laughs> that's good. It, it made me really start to question things. That it yeah. wasn't... Okay, here's the thing. I didn't always get in trouble when I drank. But right. every time I got in trouble, I was, in, I was drinking. Sure. Yeah. It was a common theme. <laughs> yeah. It was a common theme. And, you know, now it's been... I haven't had a drink in almost two and a half years. Oh, okay. So That's great. I mean, but it, it, it wasn't like, oh, after I got arrested at the airport, I was like, I'm done. No, no, no. It took a couple more years. It usually that. takes a few rock bottoms. Yeah. You know, a few of them. Um, so did you kind of, why were you, were you drinking like bottles of wine by yourself? Yeah. Okay. And I was, what was pretty, going on? like, um, I think I was a pretty, I thought that I was like a classy drunk, yeah. you know? Um, I think what was going on is, uh, for me, I, I was still dealing with a lot of like uh, figuring out who I was, mm. you know, and um, it wasn't until really like getting sober that I kind of like, you know, you have to face everything right. and face your emotions head on and be totally comfortable and confident who you are. And I think um, the reality of it was uh, growing up, having a disability, you mm. know, I have spina bifida and um I think that really, I carried like a lot of shame with that, you know? And so that, I think that's what 
my drinking did for me was I was trying to like fill this insecurity in this void because I felt uncomfortable being disabled. And now as a stand up comedian and being sober, I can talk about it openly. And I'm, I'm super grateful for all of the rock bottoms I went through because it's, I know how extreme I can get, Sure, you know, yeah. and had I not gone through those extremes, I think I would just be like, you know, kind of coasting, but those extremes made me who I am now. Mm -hmm. um, so, you, you know, you said you were kind of figuring yourself out, you know, at, this was after college, right? So yeah. kind of figuring yourself out. And I think that's common for most people, but I'm wondering with spina bifida and everything, did that kind of, in a way, define who you were in the eyes of most people as you were growing up? Well, um, what's really interesting, okay, so I uh, I never wanted to tell people what it was, mm. you know? Mm -hmm. I was just like, I'm smaller than everybody that's, you know, I would even, like, go as far as, be like, oh, I was born prematurely, which is like, okay, prem premature babies, like, grow up and become normal size, you right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, you don't yeah. just be a premature adult, like, mm -hmm. what the hell? Um, and so, yeah, I think that it did, and I think, especially when I was in college, it really messed with my self-esteem because a lot of guys would say, you know, I really like you, Lila, but uh, my friends are going to make fun of me for dating a midget, you know? And so, I would always have to date people in secret, and it kind of oh, just man. felt like, um, I felt like a broken Barbie, if that, or like a defected yeah, yeah. Barbie, you know yeah. what I'm saying? That's just like, you know, people would say, you're so pretty, but, or you're really pretty for, you know, like you're really pretty for a disabled person. Or you're, you're so pretty, but you're small, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's looking when I look back on um, just my early uh, my earlier life of dealing with spina bifida. I'm so far removed from the person that I was, the insecure mm -hmm. person that I was, because now I'm like. I just feel so confident with it. Also, it's helped that I, I've met so many other women and other people who have disabilities or have dealt with the same things that I've dealt with. And it really makes you realize, like, I'm not alone. Right. You know? Oh, definitely. Well, and I, I mean, that's one of the benefits, I think, of the age we live in with the Internet and everything else is it's so much easier to connect with other people. You know, and if it's like if I don't know if the, that kind of option was available when you were in high school or something, you probably, did you just kind of feel like you were alone in all this stuff? Oh yeah. Like I was the smallest person at my school. Right. And I, you know, there wasn't any other little people. Hmm. And so I kind of just like, I wanted to be like everybody else rather than truly embracing like that, you know, it's okay. Individual, yeah. but, okay. I also remember like being in the, I was in the fourth grade when I like realized like, oh my God, I'm the same size as first graders and I'm not going to get any taller. So I ran for ASB president because I was like, I need respect from these people at the school. Yeah. So if I become ASB president, like they'll respect me. And um, I ran for ASB president. My slogan was, I may be small, but I can make a big difference. There you go. And it was cool, you know, so yeah. it was cool for a little bit, while, for a little while. But then as I got into high school and I was just like really apparent that like, I'm really not going to get any taller and like this is what it is mm. so yeah but it was a whole like it was a whole journey of accepting spina bifida and really took me meeting other people who have spina bifida to realize that it's okay and we all like whether you're disabled or you know quote unquote normal like we all have our shit yeah oh yeah definitely exactly and that's what the whole point of this that's what this whole show is about talking about our yeah. shit um uh so for anyone listening or watching could you just like what is spina bifida so spina bifida, to put it in the simple, simple terms, it means split spine. Okay. I like telling people, it's like being born with a spinal cord injury. Uh, okay. So when I was born, I had a hole in my back and the doctors had to go in and close it. So I've had seven major operations and a majority of people, like it's a, it's called like a snowflake disability because no two spina bifida cases are alike. Mm. And a lot of people with my disability are in wheelchairs because it, it affects your walking ability. And um, I have to sometimes I wear a brace on my left foot when I'm like hiking and stuff. And, you know, they told my parents when I was born that I'd never be able to walk, that I'd have learning disabilities and have all these like really worst case scenarios to think about, which was very scary for my mom and dad. But my mom is a super strong Filipino woman. And she like, she really, really took a lot of time with me as a child to put me in therapy and kind of help me. And, um, you know, by the grace of God, I, I can walk and I'm really grateful for that. So, yeah. I mean, what, uh, did you, were you ever in a wheelchair or? Yeah. Or in, uh, to... in, in kindergarten, I was in a wheelchair okay. and my sister would push me okay. to, uh, my class yeah. and, 
it was in a full body cast. So I have a lot of memories of like being in full body cast or my leg cast and all that. And also I was thinking about this the other day. Like I have this memory of being like nine years old and I think I was in like a Walmart or Fred Meyers parking lot. And I was with my dad and he like put his hand on my left leg and he's like, he was like praying, like praying over my leg like and praying that, you know, I would be healed and that God would like help me be able to walk and do all these things. And it's like, I know. I, I, I know that people believe in whatever they believe, but I do believe that like my parents, like full love and support and encourage me, encouragement and never treating me like I was different mm -hmm. is, uh, it, is what allowed a lot of these little miracles to, you know, come to fruition. Definitely. Well, yeah, it sounds like you had very, you know, supportive parents and I'm wondering, you know, just in my own life, as I've gotten older and you hear about people's stories and backgrounds, some on the show and some just in conversation, I've really gr grown to appreciate my parents even more, yes. you know, because I think there's a natural rebellion when you're a mm -hmm. teenager and they're the ones that are telling you, you can't stay out late or whatever. But I'm wondering as you've, you know, had more and more interactions with people who had similar, uh, you know, situations that you've had, you know, have you met, talked with people whose parents were not that supportive? Oh, and, yeah. like, and I'm sure it's a nightmare. So this is going to sound so silly, but I didn't meet anybody with my disability until I was 21. Oh, okay. And I, I guess I think I was like under the impression. I don't know why, but like, I just assumed like everybody with a disability was really sweet was really like positive, like, you know, like I just thought that they had the same like traits, mm -hmm. right? But then you have to realize like people do come from different backgrounds. Yeah. And so not everybody is going to be like this positive person about it. Some people are going to be resentful or angry. And, you know, I think that because we don't have we're starting to now, but you know, we didn't really have like a lot of disabled people in the media. And we kind of, sometimes we put disabled people in this like platform of, Oh, quote unquote inspirational. But the reality mm -hmm. is disabled people are just like anybody else. You know, there are, there are assholes. There are disabled assholes, right. you know, yeah. but I think <laughs> we forget that, you right. know, we like, just because you have a disability does not make you a saint. Right. You could be, true, you could be a are, true dick. I think people are hesitant to say that, you know, if somebody has a disability, they're like, well, you know, they've been through it. It's like, no, you can just say they're an asshole. You know, they're, they're yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, you could right. just say that. So yeah. I think that was like a big shot for me, too. It's like, um, so the first time I met other people with my disability, I was like really excited. I went to like a disability like um, event and I uh, felt almost like shunned from the event because I wasn't in a wheelchair. Mm. So then I went through this kind of like, and I think this, um, so I'm 21, like I went through this like emotional, like turmoil of like, oh my God, I'm not normal enough and I'm not disabled enough. Yeah. Like, oh, that was like, that was really um, heartbreaking for me. You know, because because I'm sure you were really excited leading up to it. You're like, yeah. oh, it's like, a, yeah, it's my people, you know? Yeah. And, and so I, I feel like. Uh, at times I felt like I have felt like that. Well, like, it's like, well, you can walk and it's like, okay, but there's, you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 So that's been, that's been really weird for me. And I think going through that is probably what led me to stand up. Yeah. And it wasn't until, um, I started doing stand up that I really felt like, okay, I found my people. I found the people who get it because disabled or not, like if you can do stand up, like you really have to have gone through for me, I believe like you'd have to have gone through some shit, overcome that shit and mm -hmm. then be willing to talk about it to help other people, you know, realize that they're not alone. Definitely. Yeah. And I definitely want to get to the stand up stuff. Um, I just, I'm curious. Um, no, this is great. I love okay, it. Okay. Well, you know, I'm, I, I, I definitely don't want to, you know, I don't like defining guests by certain mm -hmm. things. So mm -hmm. it's not like, but I just am curious. Um, uh, when was the first time you were like able to have a, a relationship in public and has, or has that happened yet? Yeah. I have a boyfriend. Fantastic. I have okay. a boyfriend now, Eric Abenante. Fantastic. We've been together almost two years and he is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Um, so I know this is going to sound like so cliche, but they say like, when you really truly learn to love yourself, that's when you can find like the love of your life. Yeah. Right. And I think that, um, when I was like drinking and stuff, you, we accept the love we think that we deserve. Yes. Right. And so when I got sober, I, um, I mean, I got sober off of everything. Like, you know, Red Bull's my last real vice Caffeine, here, but, yeah. um, I, when I first got sober, I, uh, I would go on like these morning hikes every day, like six o'clock in the morning. I'm not a morning person, but mm -hmm. I would go to Fryman Canyon and I would go on these hikes and would cry, you know, and just be on this hike. And I did it consistently for three months. And then when I was around seven months sober, 
you know, that's when I like met my boyfriend, but we, uh, we had known each other in the comedy scene. Like, in fact, he had put me on one of his like backyard shows that he had. And then, uh, you know, like a year and a half later, we ended up getting together. But what's really crazy is my boyfriend's never seen me drink, Mm -hmm. which is insane to me. And, um, he's just super supportive. But I think that, you know, I chose like, I love myself. I'm going to do things that are good for myself. I'm going to date somebody that is good for me, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. and I think that when you, like I said, when you learn to love yourself and people can see that mm-hmm. and there's an attractive energy in that like, wow, this person is really confident. They know who they are. They're not trying to hide anything. Right. Like, I mean, it's, I look back on some of the things I did when I was dating, like, you know, online dating, yeah, right? I would post like a picture of just like, you know, like a selfie like this, right? Mm-hmm. And like in right here, you would think that, oh, she might be like five, six. Right. I want to put my height on there. Right. And then I would talk to a guy for like a month and be like, oh, I was going to fall in love with my personality and then be like, surprise, I'm this big. And like that never worked out well, right? No, no I so, can't imagine. No, it's horrible. Yeah. Like you, you shouldn't count catfish people on your height it's like you gotta <laughs> weed, weed out the idiots who wouldn't like you for whatever exactly yeah and so yeah just um learning to love myself and being totally transparent in all my shit yeah is what led me to uh the man i get to love every day now which yeah i'm really glad it has a happy ending you know in yeah. that regard did you find yourself sort of dating people who you maybe not even necessarily liked just but just because they were drawn to you in some way you're like okay i'll put up with like never leaving the dorm room or never, you know, just to have some sort of so, connection. Yeah. I, okay. So like I had my first real like boyfriend, um, was when I first moved to San Diego and I dated this guy and it was like public and it was on Facebook and like, you know, he would hold my hands in public. I remember like, this is so funny, but I remember walking around like, uh, there's this place in San Diego. It's like seaside something. Mm -hmm. And like, he wanted to hold hands and I I felt so uncomfortable holding his hand. I'm like, Oh my God, like people are going to know that like I'm with him. Like, is he going to feel embarrassed? Like holding my hand. I look back on that now, like, you know, eight years ago and I'm like oh my god that's so funny but it just shows like where I was um, emotionally and and, you know security wise with just how I saw myself Mm -hmm. anyways that guy cheated on me and it was horrible. Like, mm-hmm. and I, and I, and I, I put up with it because I really believed I was like, no one's going to love me, right. you know? And, um, I thought that he cheated on me cause something was wrong with my body. You know, it's not like he wouldn't cheat on me with like a girl in a wheelchair or like somebody else that was disabled. No, he cheated on me with like a quote unquote normal girl. And, um, we ended up breaking up and I moved to LA and then like a few months later, his new girlfriend contacted me and she was like, so why did you and so-and-so break up? And I told her cause he cheated on me. And then she was like, I think he's cheating on me too. Ugh. And that actually like, you know, it sounds horrible, but it made me feel better to realize like, wait a second, it wasn't you. Right. It was him. There was yeah. something wrong with him. Right. Cause this new girlfriend he has is quote unquote normal Mm -hmm. and she is beautiful and nothing's wrong with her body and he cheated on her too. So it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with him. And that was kind of like, um, you know, I can see that being a relief. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a total relief. It's not because I'm not normal or whatever like that. Yeah. He's just an asshole. Yeah. You know? Um, so you said you've been doing stand up for four years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you said you, uh, before we were on Mike, you said, uh, you've, you've had several, You've moved to LA and then had to leave a couple times. Yeah. So what is it that you think well what 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 made you leave each time? Oh my god. Uh so the first time I had beginner's luck, uh-huh. I like to say. You know, I moved here, everything like was like so magical and I was here for 3 months <laughs> and it was amazing. And then I went to go finish my senior year of college. Oh, uh-huh, okay. And then I graduated and then I moved back to California. And then I feel like that was like my trials and tribulations time. Okay. It was horrible. (laughs) There was just like a lot of bullshit that happened. You know, I dated the horrible guy. Um, I get arrested at the airport, you know, I'm homeless couch surfing. Mm -hmm. It was just bad. And then when I moved the third time is, uh, that's when I was like, okay, I really want this. I wasn't moving for a guy. I wasn't moving for anything but the fact that like I knew I wanted to be in LA. Yeah. I knew that this is where I was supposed to be. And a month later I started stand up. And so and then so in January it'll be four years this okay. third time. Like now I feel like I'm super secure here. This is it. I'm not going anywhere. So and how old were you when you started stand up? Twenty four. Okay, cool. Um and I only asked that. So so in a way, Does it feel like it took 24 years to get to a place where 
the thing with stand up is that an entire room of people are looking at you. Mm -hmm. So did it take that long to sort of get to a place where not only were you comfortable just with yourself and everything that comes with that, but to be so comfortable that you're willing to be in front of a, a room full of people. I mean, like that seems like quite a transformation that you, that you underwent, you know, you know, I, great. I was always, okay. Every time I would go out with my girlfriends, even like, even when I was in college, yeah. I was always really like friendly and talking to people. Sure. So uh, people would always say to me, like, are you some sort of comedian or something? Uh, okay. Like that yeah. happened to me a lot yeah. growing up. Like people would say that. So, um, getting into stand up, it, like I, I worked so many, I worked so many different nine to five jobs. I mean, that's a whole nother thing we could talk about, but yeah, let's go. Um, ahead. Let's do that. I, uh, I, uh, when I started stand up, it just felt so natural because I, I, mean, I was sick of working these like random jobs. And I told my mom, I was like, you know, I would love a job where it would be like I could talk to people because that's what I'm good at. I'm good at talking to people. If I get paid to talk to people, that is what I could do. Yeah. And little did I know it would become, you know, stand up comedy is yeah. where I'm supposed to be. But, um, I, just, I remember my comedy birthday is February 10th and I was in the shower and I had this epiphany. I was like, oh my God, no one's going to hire me as the four foot six love interest on a soap opera. But if I became a comedian, they would have to start looking at me. Yeah. Like comedy was going to be the thing that got me in the door. Cause I always wanted to be, um, you know, on television. My degree is uh, from Washington state was in broadcast production. Okay. I wanted to be like a news anchor behind a news desk. Yeah. In my mind, I was like sitting behind a news desk. No one would know how small I was. Sure, yeah. I mean, I was always trying to be like deceptive of my height. Yeah, yeah. And then um, doing comedy was like the ultimate, this is who I am. I'm going to talk about everything and put it all out there. Mm -hmm. so. so four years in, uh, what percentage of your material is spina bifida based? You know, I talk about disability. Mm -hmm. Of course, I have to talk about it in my uh, stand-up. I talk about it a lot, but I talk about it from all different kinds of angles, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I think it's important to talk about, you know, it's important to talk about disability because it's part of my life. Right. And also to, you know, give a voice to people who can't talk about it mm -hmm. and just so that other people can feel connected. So yeah, I'm mean, going to talk about everything. There's nothing I won't talk about. Okay. Uh, what were some of the, the nine to fives? So, um, I remember one, one job that I had, I had to, I had to wear like bunny ears okay. and walk around like a parking lot and ask people if they wanted to get a blowout from blow bunny. <laughs> this was in San Diego. Um, I worked for, <laughs> <laughs> what were people's reactions generally? <laughs> Can I get a blowout from you? Ah, <laughs> there it is. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Those types of jobs are tough. Yeah. It was horrible. You have to be on all the time. And you're, I don't, I'm not going to speak for you, but I, I've had similar jobs. Now, my face was hidden, but so I was the mascot in high school. We were the stallions. Mm -hmm. So I wore a big horse suit. And then uh, I was a, a ladybug for the Ohio Department of Natural Resources at the Ohio State Fair for a couple of summers. And uh, uh, those jobs are hard because you have to just be on all the time. And I had a voice box. So I oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh, my gosh. And I was dead inside, <laughs> you know? And, uh, <laughs> And it just really fucked with me to have to be like, hey, everybody, how's it going? And then just crying on the inside. Oh, yeah. So those types of things. And, I, you know, my face was hidden. So those types of jobs, I, I feel like are worse than most things because you're like in public and having to like, you know, be up. I think <laughs> I, I do believe that some of these like customer service type jobs that yeah. I had, like um, going door. I sold Cutco knives door to door. Mm -hmm. I did. I, uh, I sold like spa packages door to door at different. Um, we'd literally have to drive around San Diego and like go to different management offices and like pitch to them to sell uh, just spa packages. Um, I worked for a call center when I was in college, mm -hmm. call a Coog. So I would call people who went to my university and ask them to donate to the university when I'm Ooh. sure they were already in crippling debt right. from yeah. the university. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, and we had ask. to do a four for ass so like i remember one time this lady was telling me like that her house was in foreclosure and then i'd still have to be like okay but like do you do you want to do 50 dollars <laughs> she's like are you not are, are you not hearing me and i'm like okay i understand your circumstance man but like you know this really goes towards scholarships and how could you do 20 dollars <laughs> And this lady gave me twenty dollars. So good job. But I felt horrible. Well, sure. You know. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, good job. My boss was happy with I'm me sure. at the time. So I think like those kind of horrible jobs. Yeah. Help me do stand up. Well, and that's what I was going to say because in all of those circumstances, you're dealing with rejection all the time. 
Mm -hmm. You know, people no, no. And so, you know, I think that that probably does help your stand up because you've you you probably got to a point where you're like, I don't care if you laugh or not. I prefer you do, but I'm confident myself. You're not going to ruin my day. You know, I would imagine, you know, that's wow. That's really that's impressive. You know, now you're here and you're doing it. And uh, um, I am curious with the, you know, the sort of. with the Me Too movement and, you know, LGBT. And I feel like as a culture and as a straight white man, I'm not qualified to actually say if it's working. (laughs) But I feel like there's more sympathy or thought about other people than Mm -hmm. there has been before. So I'm wondering, you know, there's still obviously a lot of problems, but I think just like person to person. So I'm wondering if how, you know, people look at you or interact with you has changed, you know, over the last like 10 years or anything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I think it's so... When I think about, like, my college experience... Yeah. Right? And I think about, like... Okay. When I think about the fact that I didn't get into a sorority, and four years later, at um, my senior year, this girl told me, well, none of the sororities wanted you because we don't want to be known as a house with a crippled girl. Like, that was a thing. And it's just, it's baffling because I look now, like, you know, so many people are on YouTube uh, in, like, interabled relationships talking about it and just... I feel like I I love that we're kind of getting into this place of more acceptance and like Mm -hmm. because of social media, people have a voice and they can talk about it and you can be called out on your bullshit, right? In a way. So it is very, uh, it's just crazy to me that I just look back and I think about college and how I didn't know a single other person Mm -hmm. who was four and a half feet tall or shorter. And now living in LA, I have friends who were smaller than me, right? And I'm considered the tall one in the group. You Mm -hmm. know, I have friends of all different disabilities. I have, I have like a lot of friends with dwarfism and I feel like I connect with a lot of my friends with dwarfism because I may not be like a little person, but I like to say I have spina bifida. We still see eye to eye, you know? (laughs) So (laughs) I still feel like, and I got made fun of the same way. Mm-hmm. And some people like some people with dwarfism have gotten made fun of before. Like I've dealt with those same like mean things that were said. Yeah. So um, it's just crazy to think that like I have five friends who are three foot tall, yeah. you know, yeah. and having a, 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 such a wide variety of friends who are short and tall and, you know, in wheelchairs, not wheelchairs, like, and just being exposed to so much more of it, especially on my like social media. Like if I look at my like timeline, I'm like, I follow so many different, you know, um, people in uh, Los Angeles who mm-hmm. are doing stuff in the entertainment industry who also happen to be disabled. It's like, I just, I feel like it's so normal now. Yeah. It's so normal. And, um, This last year, I actually went to the Little People of America conference and it was my first time ever going to to this. And I'm so happy that I went. It was in San Francisco. And I go and there's 2,000 little people there, okay, of all different types of dwarfism and just different disabilities that, you know, would make a person small. And you you walk in and there's 2,000 people and it's like, okay, I'm small and, you know. What else is there? Because right. now that you're like confronted with this face to face with other people that I'm seeing eye level with, it really was just like this like wow moment, mm-hmm. you know, like yeah. number one, I'm not alone, but like, wow, now I'm not special anymore. Right. So, yeah. you know, it was just, it was crazy. And I think there was like a lot of emotions that went into that, but I'm so happy that I went. It was a very, um, very like beautiful week for me. Well, and it must have been even better having, you know, experienced the the other sort of conference that you had mentioned where you kind of felt isolated. Yeah, and then I know? and I, I guess too, it's like I've come I've come to just accept that, you know, I am in this like weird little gray area where I'm not really <laughs> some people I'm not super disabled or whatever, like or I I'm not in a wheelchair. I can walk, but I still walk with a bit of a limp. I don't have dwarfism, but I'm still a little person. You know, it's very, I'm in this weird mix. I'm in a weird mix. Mm-hmm. And, but I also feel like it's a beautiful thing because then I can, um, I can have more empathy for different types of people, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, that is something I'm really grateful for. Um, so to wrap up, what was, you know, uh, when you were, when you were much younger and kind of learning how to deal with all of, with, you know, with it, um, was there something that you kind of realized like, Oh, this is actually a benefit because of X, Y, Z. Like, you know, were you able to get sympathy or something? Did you milk anything? You know, did you You find like a positive? 
in yes. that regard. I I think the switch happened for confidence wise too was like when I was in college, you know, towards my, my last like senior year or something. And you know, when you're really small, people remember you, mm. which is a great thing. Yeah. When you're something's different about you, people remember you. So you can use that to your benefit. And I think while I was on this like slow journey of self acceptance, one of the first things I trained my brain to think was, okay, people are gonna stare at you because you're small, but they're gonna keep staring because you're so beautiful. You know, and that's yeah, what I would yeah, think yeah. in my mind so that, you know, I wouldn't get angry when somebody was staring. Because I, before, I think I used to be be like that. And I still have some friends, who, you know, they'll get mad if someone's like staring and they'll just like, you know, like they'll, they'll get defensive about it. And I try to be like, you know, people are gonna stare if it's different. If a, a guy walks in here with no arms, I'm gonna look. Right. I'm going to look, yeah. but it's not because I'm coming from a place of, you know, um, meanness. I'm just, it's, I'm curious. And a lot of times people are curious. And if I can be that person to smile, especially like a child that's yeah. looking at me, you mm -hmm. know, because children, a lot of times I've had children ask me straight up, are you a big kid or an adult? Like mm -hmm. what's going on here? And I love right. that. I love yeah. when kids ask me that, you know, right, cause it's I so just, honest. I had this one little girl, I was at the beach and she asked me if I was, I'm a big kid or an adult. And I told her I was an adult. And then she was like, why do you walk all crazy? It was so funny. She's like, you know, just like, why do you walk all crazy? And then I told, I explained spina bifida to her and I explained about wheelchairs and stuff. And she's like, oh, like a grandma? Like, you're supposed to be like a grandma? And I'm like, oh my God, this is so funny. <laughs> but she was just really coming from a place of curiosity. Right. Yeah. And I feel like if I can like be that person to smile at a stranger or just like, allow that open dialogue you know that's it's like these little things that's gonna maybe the next time they see somebody you know they'll just be a little bit more aware and like exactly. i feel like it's our uh like as some disabled people it's like our place to kind of like help educate and we not like have it and i the world is not perfect so it's not going to happen overnight but mm. there's a lot of beautiful big changes that have been made you know there's i see it's starting the changes are starting to occur and i want to celebrate that yeah most definitely well, I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking about it all. Yeah, um, this has been so awesome. Uh, where can people find you on social media? You guys can find me at Love Lila Hart, L-O-V-E-L-I-L-A-H-A-R-T. And I have a show called Small Talk with Lila Hart. Small mm -hmm. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's on Channel 310. Okay. So Channel 310 is a, a YouTube account that um, my boyfriend and all of our comedian friends put together. And we have several shows on there mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, with all super talented Los Angeles comedians. So what do you what's the premise of your show? So um, it's like a I would say it's like a mix between like Johnny Carson and Chelsea Handler. Okay. So I come out and I do a 10 minute monologue and then I have different panels. I have a small talk panel. Uh, my uh, One of my best friends, Drew Presta, she's on that panel. She has uh, dwarfism and she is a gorgeous model. Mm. And she comes on the show and, you know, talks about what's going on in the disability world. And then, you know, we just talk about our friendship. Yeah. And then um, I'll have a comedian come out and then I have musicians and then I have uh, another panel with the comedians and we talk about like what's going on in the news. So they have like their, you know, com uh, comedic commentary. It's hell fun. yeah. So it's, it's, it's a talk show. Yeah, That's it's really cool. Show. How often does it come out? So um, we've done eight episodes. Cool. And so you check out the last eight episodes. We are in the middle of moving right now. So okay. once we get the venue up and going, we'll start filming again. Well, that's fantastic. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming on. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me. This has been great. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that was the episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that I did. It was a real pleasure talking with Lila. Uh, like I said, hell of a rapper. So, you know, she can do it all. I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did, five stars on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, please. It's greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, that's that's pretty much all I got. I hope uh, if you are willing to put forth the effort to get a Halloween costume that you found one that you like. I personally am lazy, so I probably won't get anything until the day of Halloween, in which case I'll say, oh, I should get something and then I'll pay too much for it because it'll be uh, too late. So anyway, that's all I've got for this week. So until next Wednesday, keep laughing.